Good morning, Heritage Alliance Church. How are you doing? I'm so glad that I can join with you this morning from Honduras. Uh, we're here with the young adult team and we're doing a discipleship adventure trip. Uh, we're studying the Word of God every day as well as just going out in the country on a little bit of venture, learning about the culture and the people, learning about some of the needs here and learning about ourselves and awesome times as well and just having a good time. And we happen to be out here on um, some beaches right now on a very small island in Chaos Cochinos uh, where we're spending a couple nights. It's incredibly hot and so I'm up early in the morning to try to beat the, the heat here as I talk to you before the sun kind of comes up. Um, but we're having a really, really good time. We thank you for uh, the prayers that you've been giving to keep us safe. Everything's been going fantastic and we're just really enjoying ourselves. And so thank you for the opportunity to do this together. Uh, we do want to continue the series this morning on a firm foundation. And we're looking at verses again that we can kind of base our life on that give us stability, knowing you know what's life about and what are we trying to accomplish and how does God direct us through his word and what are some key verses in times of decision, um, times of commitment, when we feel like God's asking us to do something? Um, what are the verses that you go to? And so I want to go to a, a verse today. I'm going to have you turn in your Bibles today to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. And uh, we're going to look at a fair large chunk of text today. But I want to give you my key verse right up front for Matthew 25 verse uh, 40 here. It says... And the king will say, I tell you the truth, when did, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. And of course, that's the ending to a long section that we're going to look at in, in just a minute. And so keep your Bibles open to Matthew chapter uh, 25. I'm not going to have on the screen any notes for you to follow or anything. So you have to take out your own pen and paper there and take notes today. It's just going to be far too complex to get this all put together and sent off to you uh, to make sure that it's, it's working well for you. And so let's just open in a word of prayer as we begin this morning together. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity that you've given us to be out here. I thank you for those who have come today, those who are watching online. And uh, we do come to you with lots of things in our life. And, and sometimes those things feel shaky, they feel uncertain, and yet um, you know what you're doing. And so we pray that as we come to your word, that you will give us direction in our life, that you will show us how to have a good firm footing, um, that we might move forward from wherever we're at today. So we pray that you'd lead us forward. Would you teach us through your word today by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Okay, I want to tell you a little bit about why I love Honduras. Obviously, you can see behind me, uh, it's very, very beautiful here. And uh, many years ago, it was about uh, five years ago, I was actually watching TV and uh, I saw a show that was based in Honduras and I thought, I never thought Honduras could look like that. And so I actually, in a random kind of idea, thought I want to go down and I want to see this place to see if it actually looks like this in real life. And so I came down here with a person, a friend of mine from church, and we looked around and, and uh, ended up finding a little piece of property. And I thought that would be something for our future. Maybe we should do that. And I didn't do it quickly. Uh, over a couple of years, we went ahead and we actually did that. And so I fell, I fell in love with the beauty of Honduras for sure. And seeing what... Uh, you know you can do down here was just fascinating there's like you know there's a venture stuff for sure there's a great time for your family and there's snorkeling there's islands there's ocean all those things that i absolutely love so i i fell in love with the beauty of honduras first and you know as you start looking into beauty all of a sudden you started seeing i started seeing uh, other things of course going on which in honduras is extreme poverty um, and so there's lots of needs here and I thought, you know, if, I, if I'm planning to come down here ever and spend time with my family, if I ever want to do something in retirement down here, you know, I better be committed to being a part of the local people as well. I, I should probably get to know some. So I thought, you know, I should try to find a sponsor child. And so I started looking into that and uh, I couldn't, couldn't find any organizations in the area that I wanted to be in where they were sponsoring kids or anything like that. And I was looking through mission organizations and sure there's lots in Honduras, but none in this particular area. Working uh, with the Garfunian people, which are the people that originally came over as slaves uh, in the islands. And so they've, in this area on the coast, they've moved in here 
um, and, and they're not integrating very well. They, they do speak Spanish, um, but they're, they're very poor and they're seen as lesser kind of citizens and not really from this land, um, for, even though I've been here for actually probably a couple hundred years now. So, you know, they don't integrate well, they don't get education, they don't get to move forward, they don't have a lot of hope. And so a lot of the same needs um, I saw in the people I had seen before in Haiti, which is, you know, early pregnancy, you know, 12 and um, 14 year old girls already having children. Um, and then the teenage boys with no future for jobs, no future for education, ended up in trying to drug traffic or just in gangs up to no good or just dying early through uh, some of their behaviors and interactions with each other in gangs. Um, so, you know, the, the needs was definitely there. And so I wanted to do something. I ended up finding uh, a small Facebook page and uh, I saw that there was a family in this little community of, of Sambo Creek that I just fell in love with. This community um, is beautiful. It's like a little fishing village right on the side of the ocean and the beaches stretch for just miles and miles and miles and miles. And again, very, very beautiful. Um, but as you walk kind of into town, as you see the town, as you go past the people, you do see in their eyes a, a sense of hopelessness, a sense of, of desperate need. And so you do see poverty uh, and then I, I thought, found when you stopped and you, you kind of get up close and personal, it just wasn't poverty that started breaking my heart. It's, it's poverty plus, you know, poverty plus everything that they even have is, isn't working anymore. Whether you see uh, several broken wheelchairs, so they have a wheelchair to sit in all day, but it's not even movable. The brakes aren't working. The, the, the wheels aren't working. Um, you see that uh, when you get to know that not only are they in a house that you know you wouldn't want to live in for sure but they're in a house and and they're being evicted because they don't have enough money to pay the rent on this house because very very few people actually um, have enough money to own anything and so uh, an older gentleman that you know we met he's amazing you know he's he's his whole past is in planting crops and all those kind of things and yet he's in a, a little piece of property where there's not no area to plant anything and so um, you know the needs are there and then they're they seem to be exasperated by other things and then the kids uh, are there and they have they have needs they do uh, end up going to school but of course they have to pay some for school and so there's needs there whether they can afford to go and so many of the kids end up you know just staying around the house or, or working with the parents um, helping with the cattle or or the chickens or whatever just to help the family out and not getting any education whatsoever and so when you, you look at poverty you do find out that there's just more more needs when you stop and and you do ask questions and you look around the trees are beautiful the ocean is beautiful um, but it was hard on me to say, you know what, this is a place that I could relax and enjoy if I knew, you know, what the people down the street were going through. And so God challenged me and, and led me to this passage where he does talk about, you know, there's coming a day in which we're going to stand before him and we're going to give an account of our, of our life and, and what we we did with it. And I want to read it to you. So Matthew chapter 25 verse 14 says again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and trusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave them five bags of silver to one, two bags and another of silver and to another one, one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. And then he left on his trip. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earn five more. And the servant with two bags of silver also went to work and he earned two more. But the servant who received one bag of silver, he dug a hole in the ground and he hid the master's money. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and he called them to give an account of how they had used his money. The servant to whom he entrusted five bags of silver, well, he came forward with five more and the master said, he said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to, to invest in you, and I've, I've earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handing a small amount. So now I will give you more responsibilities, and let's celebrate together. The servant who had received the two bags of silver, he came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I have earned two more. The master said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling a small amount, so now I'm going to give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. 
And then the servant with one bag of silver came and said, Master, I, I knew you were a harsh man. You know, you harvest crops where you didn't plant, gathering crops that you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money. So I hid it in the earth. Look here, your money is right here. You can have it back. But the master replied, You wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvest crops I didn't plant and I, I gathered crops I don't cultivate, then why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered to take the money from this servant and give it to the one with ten bags of silver. And he says this, this is the conclusion of the story, to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant out into utter darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Well, that is a really sobering story when you read it. And, and part of me, it, it bothers deeply because I grew up with this whole thing of like wanting fairness, you know. And uh, in our society today, of course, we hear a lot about equality and equity and fairness. And this doesn't seem very fair. You know, why would... Why would the master just choose to give one five, one two, one one, and and expect them to do something, you know, with with his money, um, and not just hang on to it, but actually use it and and multiply, multiply it, and it seems like a, a little bit unfair. And when I was a kid, I remember my my sister and I once in a while we'd be given like a chocolate bar from my my parents to share, and. Uh, and then we had to make up a plan. We had one chalk bar and we're supposed to share this thing. So what do we do? You know, how do we, how do we handle the, the dividing up? And so we made up some rules, of course, whether it was a pop that we were sharing or whether it was a chalk bar is that whoever cuts, um, you know, the other person gets to choose. If one person cuts it in half, the other person gets to choose which piece. And so that was a very tense time. You know, you had to like take out the chalk bar and you had your knife and you had to like try to measure it twice <laughs> before you cut it. I remember, you know, putting the pop in two glasses and you're pouring, you're pouring one in and you go, oh, oh, how much do I got left to pour in a little bit of the other one? Because at the end, I mean, if it wasn't fair, the other person was definitely going to win the day. And so you wanted to be very careful to make sure it was, it was fair and you weren't going to lose anything yourself. You know, it was a very kind of self-motivated thing. So fairness was always a big deal. And so this parable, you know, you get challenged a little bit on, you know, is, is God fair? But when we look around, I mean, in, in the world today, you look around in your neighborhood and, and you'll notice, of course, life, life isn't fair. And God, you know, has somehow blessed people with different things, not just financially, but, you know, a certain family dynamic, maybe, if maybe a family that you wanted, or, you know, they got these kids, or they don't, they have kids, and you don't have kids, or maybe you've struggled in your family with, with cancer, and someone else seems to be doing um, fine, and, you know, everyone's healthy, and everyone's happy, and someone's got all this inheritance, you know, and you thought, oh, if I could only get an inheritance like that, it would change everything. Um, some are just getting by and some are making it really well. And so you look at the world and you go, yeah, it's not, it's not even, is it? It's not, it's not fair. And, you know, at that point you kind of say, well, where do I fit? Am I the, am I the person that got kind of five, five bags? Um, am I the person that got two? Or am I the person that maybe got one bag? And how do I respond when I think that? Now, I think most of us would not say we're the ones with the five bag. And so, you know, sometimes we go, hey, you know, I'm probably the one with two. You know, I'll put myself in the story in the middle. I'm probably doing okay, you know, at some level. So maybe I'm not one, but I'm definitely not, not five. But as I started to, you know, look into, into the world, and you have a world's perspective, which I would suggest is the best way to have a kingdom perspective. So the kingdom of God... He has a perspective of all people, of course, of all time at the same time. And God, God's idea of, of humanity and how it works and how they interact together. And so when he's talking about people and he's talking about the kingdom of God, he definitely is having a larger perspective than we typically have in our, in our area. And so we have to look at, you know, from a, a global perspective, we have to look at it from kind of almost a, a time frame perspective, perhaps, you know, from humanity all the way till now, like this whole spectrum of time. In that, where, where do we find ourselves where God has invested in us? What's available to us? Um, what do we have as resources? And so when I started to do assessments in my life, I realized, you know, 
I, I travel, look at me, I'm traveling. I have uh, capabilities of resources of accessibility. Um, one of the things I've been amazed at here working now with a family in Honduras is how accessible that is, you know, that I can talk to them and I can communicate and send pictures back and forth and, and it's not a letter by boat or anything or by plane. It doesn't take months to hear what's going on. It's, it's real time. And so there's real opportunities for us to not just invest where we are locally or to build relationships, but globally, you know, we're living in a time that's, of course, no other generations had that access to be able to go, personally go, it used to be a, a huge, huge deal. And now it's, it's not a big of a deal anymore to go um, when it comes to resources and finances, but also just communication and the ability to share the gospel um, is actually way, way easier than it ever has. And then you have to look at, you have to look at the world as a, as a whole, even today, for example. Do you realize, and you, you probably have heard these things, but they're, they're hard um, to acknowledge they're true. You know, one billion people in the world today live on less than a dollar a day. One billion people out of seven live on less than one dollar a day. Three billion live on less than two fifty a day. Two hundred, no, two dollars and fifty cents. Three billion people. It's just about half. Eighty percent of the world lives on less than ten dollars. A day so you got to put that in perspective and one percent if you were in the one percentile top of one percent of the world income today it just means that you make over thirty five thousand dollars a year so even for those that are retiring you know you'll get retirement income you say well man I you know I, I'm I'm still in the one percent of the world when it comes to what I've been given so how many bags again have you been given so you go back to that I, I had to admit one day that, you know, I, I've been given five, five bags and there's going to be a lot expected of me at the end of the day. And how do I use this and use this well? I mean, you can use excuse and I've heard it many times in my profession. Well, I'm just the pastor, you know, we don't necessarily get paid well. I, I think I get paid, paid well, but I can, I can do a lot with some of those resources and I have access to people. I have knowledge now where I can go and see. And what I've seen, when I look into the faces of the people around Honduras, I go, you know, there's something I got. I got to have a part here. I got to do something. It, it can't be, it can't be that hard for me to try. And so I, I've been on that journey, and I've been trying to figure that out and doing it well. And you know, and that's that's the hard part is how do I invest well so that I, I'm supporting and partnering with people. I'm not, you know, controlling. I'm not dominating. I'm not looking like I'm a hero. That's all hard stuff. We're not we're not really used to knowing how to do that. But at the end of the day, what I've realized is I'm actually going to be accountable. It's like God expects me to live a, a fulfilling life. We've talked a little bit about that. God's for you. God wants you to enjoy life and enjoy it to the most. But there's another piece. He just doesn't want you to have a fulfilling life. He actually wants you to have a, a fruitful life, a fruitful life. And when I think of fruit now, it's different, you know. Um, here on the, on the property that I've been helping this family work on, the, the fruit is amazing. I mean, we got like sugar cane growing and we got pineapples growing. We got mango trees growing. We got papaya growing. Um, it's just on and on and on. I mean, there's just tons of vegetables and that stuff. And we got to go around as a team and we got to try, try all these different fruits out. And, and you realize like one of these mango trees is producing thousands of mangoes, thousands of mangoes. And, and even they can't, of course, eat all that. And so what do you do when you've been given an abundance is, of course, you share, you know, you, you share. And they, they're constantly taking what they have and they're sharing it with other people. And so to be fruitful means that I'm going to produce things in my life that aren't just for my, aren't just for my benefit. I'm going to produce things in life that actually are going to benefit other people. And so to be really fruitful means there's other people that from me are going to experience actually a fulfilling life as well. So who are those people? Who are those people for you? And of course, I'm not recommending everyone comes to, to Honduras. That's, that's where God has led me to go. But who is, who is reaping the benefits of what God has invested in you? And, and, and you need to always put a pause in it. Don't just think about money. You got to think about your talents and your skills and abilities and, uh, you know, your passions and for sure, your resources, but you know, you have a vehicle to use. Maybe you have a house to use. Maybe you have, you know, an ability to go pick up things for people. 
So what has God put in your, in your hands? What has he placed in your hands in which he's one day going to say, so come and give an account for what I gave to you. And I think that's one of the challenges is, did he give it to you or did you achieve it yourself? And as you journey with Jesus for a while, I've come to the conclusion, you know, I, what if I was born? You know, what if I was born here? What if I was, I mean, one of the sobering things to realize is uh, we were out on a little island even um, just yesterday. And you're looking at this island and there's 40 families living on this island. 40 families living on this little island and there's lots of boats around and, and there's just brand new little babies around. And this is where they live. I mean, this is where they, they just showed up. And so the expectation on their life accountability has got to be different than mine. I mean, I've been given so much. I could have I could have just been born out here. But I wasn't. I was born in a way that allows me to travel and and have opportunities to connection and invest my life for other people. And so I feel like that's that's what we're really called to do. So after this passage, there's a there's another part and it continues in verse 31. And I, I won't read the whole thing, but it says at that time when everyone will come and give an account. So he's, he's, he's referring back to that, you know, when, when you've been given things, one day the master will call us back to give an account. So he says when the, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, you know, people are going to come and, and he's going to separate those who are his followers and those who, who did not follow him. And he's going to say to those who he brings into his kingdom, you are, you are blessed by my Father. Inherit the kingdom that was prepared for you. From the creation of the world for and listen to this for i was hungry and you fed me i was thirsty and you gave me a drink i was a stranger and you invited me into your home i was naked and you gave me some clothing i was sick and you cared for me and i was in prison and you visited me and these righteous ones that i've called into my kingdom they're going to turn to me and they're going to say wait a minute hang on a second lord like I don't remember, like, when was that time that you were thirsty? Can you remind us? When was it the time that you were a stranger and we invited you in our home? We didn't, we didn't see that happen. We didn't, we didn't know you needed clothing. We didn't clothe you, did we? When did we see you sick or what? You weren't in prison, were you? Like, we didn't do those things for you. What are you talking about? It says in verse 40 then, look, the king will say, and this is our key verse, I tell you the truth, when you did it for one of these, the least of these, of my brothers and sisters, you were doing it as if it was me. You were doing it to me. And then the king's going to turn to the others on the other side who, who don't get to come into the kingdom because they didn't live according to the kingdom values. And he's going to say, away from me. You are cursed. You need to depart to the eternal fire prepared for the devil because I was hungry. I was thirsty. I was a stranger. I was naked. I was outside your house. You didn't invite me in. You didn't give me clothing. You didn't visit me. I was in prison. I was in chains. And you didn't bother to come to me. And then they'll say, Lord, we didn't, we didn't see that. I mean, if we came and we saw you, you know, you were hungry. Of course we would have gave you something to eat, you know. We didn't see you being a stranger. We would have invited you in. You're a good guy. You know, we, we didn't know you were in prison. When did that happen? We would have, we would have visited you. So tell you the truth, when you refuse to help people when they have these needs, you're refusing to help me. And so part of the kingdom of God means we need to see all people a little bit differently. We see this, that we have an opportunity. I talked about that a few weeks ago. An opportunity. An opportunity to invest for the kingdom of God. It's a huge, huge privilege. And so the question is, what, what are you going to do with your opportunity? So I've asked Caroline. Caroline's picked three people today out there. And here's what we're going to do. I want you to just get a feel for uh, this on a little bit, at least in a practical well, way. So Caroline, I, I need you to go out there and you're going to go find the person that you're going to give uh, $50 to. And you go find that. And I'm just going to enjoy and find the person for $20 and find the person for, for $10 and uh, go give them that money. And I'm just going to check out the view here as it's getting, getting pretty good. Maybe I'll take you with me as you're doing that for those that are waiting beautiful little cove that I'm hanging out in this morning. It's just fantastic, of course. I, you know how I got over here? I actually got over here on a paddleboard, so I had to like try not to get soaked as I got over here. Okay, Caroline, I'm sure you've, you've done that already. You've handed out that money. 
So here's the thing about the money. Is there, there's a few of you got that. What you need to know right off the bat is, is kind of simple. One is you didn't deserve it. <laughs> and, and you didn't get to decide how much, you know. And so one of you got 50 and the other one got 10. <laughs> That's kind of how it is. And neither of you, none of you deserve that. She didn't pick you because you deserved it. She just picked you. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to go around this week with that with you. Take it with you. It's so small. I mean, it's a small thing, but I want you to look for an opportunity. I want you to look for a way in which you would say, you know, what would, what would Jesus do with this money this week? Maybe you need to take your time. Don't just run out the door, find the first need and go, I did it. But process that for a second. That money is from Jesus today. What, what would he want you to do with it? It's not a lot. But how will you invest it? And for the rest of you, here's what you can do, because I don't have enough money for all of you. I did this for a while. I took $100, $100 bill, and I folded it up small, and I, I hid it in my wallet. And I just let it be there. And maybe you only can do 50, maybe you can do 10, maybe you can do 20, doesn't matter. And I carried it with me. And I just waited to see what would be the opportunity that Jesus would have. How, what kind of perspective would I need to, where would he invest it? Where, where would he give it away? And, uh, and it's a great experience. And when you do it, you, you want to do it again. You're like, man, I want to take a little more, or maybe it's a little less this time, whatever, and you put it, put it there and just say, this is being dedicated for that. Now, of course, that's, that's actually not the point. That's not the point of giving at all. The point of giving is not actually to look for needs, but this is a good exercise just to learn the process. That's not really what giving is all about, is just meeting needs all over the place. I think giving is about becoming like God. Now that sounds a little weird for people maybe new in the church, but <laughs> our job is to become like Jesus, to be transformed into new character, to become like Him. And so part of who God is, is He's a giving God. For God so loved the world, that He gave. He gave His Son. And so part of our development here in this world, part of our character, the reason Jesus talks so much about money and so much about this investment and so much about one day giving an account, the account that we're giving, I, I don't think is much all about, you know, uh, whether you're in or out. I, there's a good question on that probably from this passage. But I think it's far more about the investment that God put in you, your skills and abilities, your personality, your experiences, your resources, your time, your money, and how have you invested it? Have you put those things into the kingdom of God? Or have you actually held on to it for fear, maybe? Or have you held on to it because you thought you earned it and you did deserve it and, and this is for you? So you have to wrestle with the question, you know, maybe God gave you more money. Maybe you're in the 1% of the world because he really um, wanted your kids to never have to worry about their future. Maybe that was it. Uh, maybe he just he gave you extra and you're in the 1% of the world because he loves you more. Hmm, I don't know. I, I, I'd hate to say that out loud. That can't be it. Maybe it's because he wants you to be safe and secure and, and he doesn't want you to have to live by faith. No, that's probably not it. So why is it, why is it that God gave you, put you into the 1%? Why did he give you the five bags? Potentially. I believe, because he wanted you, he entrusted you with the kingdom of God and investing in the kingdom of God for the benefit of others, that you would produce fruit in your life and that other people would experience the fruitfulness because you love Jesus so much that when you're in the world, the people around you or where you go get to benefit from the investment that God has made in you. I think that's it. I think that's it for me anyways. And so I remember when I came here and I started looking at what I could do with the resources I had. And, and I didn't have tons. But I had, it, I had enough for here. And that was what an amazing part was. You know, if I cut a few things down in my life and I, and I saved a little bit of my extras. And so whenever I made a little bit of extra money somewhere or, you know, I got that income tax back or I got a rebate back or a Canada, Canada check back or anything like that. Whenever I got anything like that, I put it in a different account now. And, uh, and I've been able to do that. And God's, of course, just brought things more to me to, to invest, I think, in what he's doing. 
And so I see, I see my resources differently now. And uh, it's been a privilege to be out here and to show the young adults and to have them exposed you know, to this beautiful community, this beautiful family that I, I love now and get to work with. And I, I said it once to you before, you know, I, I get more joy, more joy over buying something for the, the family here in Honduras to use, more joy by investing in trees or planting, more joy by giving towards the kingdom because this family um, that I'm supporting now, they are in turn now, um, he's teaching in the, in the schools, in the elementary schools, the high schools that we got to visit. He's in there teaching the gospel and teaching these kids about scripture. And now he's, he's teaching these other kids how to grow their own food. And, and uh, we're, what we're doing on, on Sunday is going to be um, fantastic. We're, we're kicking off his, his ministry for the fall that really struggled through COVID. The kids weren't allowed to gather in the groups anymore and come for teaching. And so uh, we're doing a big, a big fun day on the beach. And the idea is just to get the attention of the community. We're hoping for like a hundred kids to come out and, uh, and, and he's gonna get the opportunity to tell them that he cares about them, he loves them, he wants to help them, he wants to help equip them um, how to grow crops, but he wants to teach them about Jesus. And they're welcome to come and, and he wants to spend time with them every week. And he's gonna challenge the parents to, to send the kids and to support the kids in their education journey and support them in their faith journey. And so it's a, uh, it's a great opportunity for us to just join and partner with them. And I, I love being able to do that. And uh, I hope the young adults and I hope you today will be a little bit more challenged to have a global perspective, a kingdom perspective of the investment that God has made in your life. On Sunday, I'm hoping, I'm hoping later in the afternoon after this is over, the service is over, um, on our Facebook channel, I'm hoping to go live for a few minutes, which means there's going to be a video pop up live from from the beach as we interact with the kids, and uh, I invite you to kind of watch it. You can watch it later because if you don't make live, it stays on there for a while, anyways. And I just want to show you what we're up to. It's going to be a lot of fun and a lot of kids, and uh, you get to see the area of uh, Sambo Creek a, a little bit better. Um, so I invite you to come participate with that. Let me close in a word of prayer for you today. I know this is a challenging talk. It's, it's one thing to be a challenging talk. It's another thing to see it here in person and look in the eyes of people that you know God loves in deep, deep need. And so, yeah, we're challenged too, with you. This isn't at you. This is definitely a with you challenge from God's word today. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for meeting our needs. You've done that. And I know we still have our needs and, and often we don't feel like we're the rich. <laughs> The world tells us we're, we should want more. The world tells us that we never will have enough. There's always more for us. There's better things out there and better cars and better phones and better computers and better homes and better vacations. And, and so we, we often don't feel like we're the ones that you've entrusted the most to. We feel like we're lacking. And that we, we, uh, we ask for forgiveness for that. That's, that's, that's uh, very ungrateful for us to think that way. So I pray that you would change our hearts. Would you look at what we do have in our hands? And, and maybe that's not the resources of finance, but maybe it's time. The time to pray for people, the time to call people, the time to encourage people, the time to communicate to people, maybe somewhere in the world even. Maybe it's just we have a few resources like a vehicle or we have our health and we can invest it, or we have energy and we can spend it with kids and invest in those kids or in the youth program this year. There's so many ways that we can use what you've put in our hands. So I pray this week as we go from here that you would remind us the ways in which you've invested in us, that we would multiply that investment for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray these things, amen. God bless you, can't wait to see you this week.